This is the Ladies Who Lead podcast. I'm your host, Luna Love. I'm blessed to be here chatting with some of the most amazing and inspiring female leaders we have today to share their stories with you all. I'm ever so passionate about the call humanity is receiving, especially us women, to step forward in our birthright as leaders. A new era in women's leadership is unfolding, where actions are heart-centered, where we encourage others to step into their greatness, and self-care is a priority. So for the next 45 minutes or so, we'll be engaging in the lost art of storytelling, where vulnerability and celebration are abundant, and women who inspire you share their challenges, triumphs, tips, and tools for you to step into personal leadership in your life. Welcome. Beloved listeners, myself and the Ladies Who Lead team are excited to announce that after two years of offering this program from the devotion of our hearts, we are opening ourselves to receiving your support via Patreon. If you've received nourishment from this podcast, you can now give back by pledging as little as a dollar a month or as much as you're moved to, to share your appreciation. We are so grateful to receive your support and intend to continue to offer and improve the show with your help. You can go to patreon.com forward slash ladies who lead to see all of our rewards and get yours today. It takes a village. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash ladies who lead. This episode of Ladies Who Lead is sponsored by our online interactive community, the Sisterhood of Remembrance, where we welcome you, all of you. This is a community which honors your gifts, your fullest expression, your purpose, your love, and your innate beauty. This is a brave space. We regard sharing as a spiritual process. As we share, we come into balance. There's a natural giving and receiving that takes place. This is a rich community of engagement and support. In the Sisterhood of Remembrance, we regard the sharing of our inner experiences as an aid in our collective shared remembrance. Come join us on your journey of remembrance at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Sisterhood of Remembrance, or just search the Sisterhood of Remembrance on Facebook. See you there. Hello and welcome everyone. Today we are blessed to announce that we have Susanna Barkataki here with us to dive deep and share her wisdom. Susanna is a yoga diversity and unity educator and founder of Ignite Yoga and Wellness Institute. Susanna is Indian and British, a mixed Desi, bridging cultural connections across difference with yoga as the pathway to shaping change. She believes in a world where yoga leads us to union union with the broken or shameful parts of ourselves and with the groups that we think of as different or other. She explores yoga as teacher for healing personally and socially. You can always find her at SusannaBarkataki.com and we're so excited to have her here with us today. Welcome, Susanna. Hi, thank you so much for having me, Luna. Excited to chat with you. So as always, we begin with a little grounding and blessing if it feels good to you you can allow the eyes to close and just find your feet or your seat allowing the body to reside where it is in time and space and bringing your awareness to how you feel in this present moment right here right now and acknowledging all that you've experienced and all the choices you've made to lead you right here, right now. Acknowledging your arrival in this moment and trusting that there's something here for us to give and receive. There's something that has brought us here for a reason and we open ourselves to that reason and to that mystery. We connect with each other in this global community of storytelling and listening and sharing and becoming and empowering women through personal storytelling by sharing a collective breath. So wherever you are, find your breath and exhale completely, emptying the body. And on your inhale, you're gonna receive all of those beautiful people in this community, no matter the country or the color around you. 
fill yourself with that. And on your exhale, you're giving yourself back out to that world, to this community of listeners and change makers. And when you're ready, let's open the eyes and find ourselves back in this shared space. So I'd love if you could share a little bit with our audience and myself about who the woman that we're here speaking with today is and what has your journey to becoming her look like, felt like, been like, mm -hmm. tasted like? <laughs> yes. I, first, to thank you for that drop in. That was really beautiful. And I felt that exchange culturally and of worlds because my journey here has been one of many worlds. And I was born in England to a white mom, British mom, and an Indian dad at a time when mixed race marriage wasn't even legal in this country, in the United States. And so because of all of that, um, also in England, there wasn't a lot of love or support for mixed race couples. They couldn't even find someone to marry them when they first got together we moved here. They thought, oh, we'll go to America, the land of diversity and the land of, of freedom and opportunity. And so when we moved here, I um, was so shy and I didn't know quite where I fit in because I was, I was like coming from all these worlds, right? Now, when I look back, it was very British, very kind of Indian, but didn't really understand what that meant. I'd never been to India yet. And I was in this new culture and new context. And so I was so shy, like so shy that I wouldn't even do my homework if I knew that I had to read it aloud. And I love to do homework and to do a good job in school. So, um, so what changed things for me, because my adolescence was kind of tough, you know, um, going through all that and, and not really finding a group or um, any space to help me understand or process what I'd gone through. But I graduated college and I came back and I taught at the high school that I went to. And I taught an ESL at that time. I don't know what we call it now, but English second language class. So it was all these people from all over the world, Ukraine, you know, El Salvador, Mexico, um, Africa, Ghana, you know. And it was like I found my stride and I found my voice. And I was able to help those other immigrants and those other people bridge their world into this world and into the U.S. with warmth and with community and with honoring where they had come from and also connecting to who we are here. And so I feel like that's the work I will always be doing. That's the work that I continue to do is like bridging different cultures as I continue to kind of mend and heal within in myself too. And so where did yoga come along because I know that's a huge part of your work and so where in that journey did you find that path yeah that's a great question so uh, when we talk about yoga I also like to really define our terms because yoga in the United States and in the West really means physical practice asana and yoga has eight limbs which I know you know Lena um, and probably many of your listeners know so really practicing the other seven limbs is where I started. It was especially with ethics. My aunties and uncles taught me, you know, you do this or you don't do this. And that's like the yamas and niyamas, the ethical foundation of yoga. Um, if you want to be happy, you know, betta, they would call me child, like make sure that you're being truthful, make sure that you're being loving and that you're helping people who maybe don't fit the idea of who you would choose as a friend, but th those are the ones you want to take care of. So it started there, started just with like cultural support and little guidance. And then also, you know, like many of us, I think, um, especially today, it's getting more and more. I had a lot of anxiety as a child for various reasons. And so my dad would guide me at night to see this blue light at the center of my forehead and imagine you know even when i was really young like four or five six imagine that light filling my whole body and with that like i would be able to fall asleep finally even though i was anxious about school the next day so 
I feel like all of that was the beginning of my yoga. And then my formal yoga practice, like what we would consider asana, I guess, started more, I think, in 2001 when I began to teach, as I mentioned, and I realized, oh, if I don't do something really clear every morning to hold myself together, I'm not going to be able to serve these 250, like, intense, you know, traumatized high school students. And so in the mornings, I would do a physical asana practice and I would meditate every day before school um, for my first year where I'd come home crying, right? And then I'd come home and I'd do a yoga nidra, do body, full body relaxation, because it was the only way to downregulate from everything that I was holding that wasn't just mine. Right. And so I love this because I get a scope into the the childhood pieces that have shaped this and the different cultural backgrounds. And so my guess is like your mom didn't have these practices Mm -hmm. um, that your dad was integrating into your childhood to support you, not knowing like there was a name like yoga or anything maybe related to it. And so uh, you have, you have probably different tools or ways of being that were adopted from from that side and they create this whole of who you are and who you're becoming and like looking at that interior and seeing what I, what I love that you shared is like seeing yourself as the bridge. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I, I love that you bring in my mom and the tools she had, you know, the British side is so interesting and it's hard to say what's my particular family and then like the general culture. But what I got from my mom and her mom, my grandmother, Evelyn Purnell, is, um, and I love speaking her name because she's such a huge influence in my life. Um, and a lot of my work is around acknowledging the ancestors and how they show up. So she, they were powerhouses. They were leaders and like, action takers and risk takers and forward thinkers at a time when for women, like my mom studied chemistry, um, married an Indian man, right? When no one, when, when, and my grandma, she was complicated. She said to my mom, you'll have to adopt. You can't have half breeds. Um, And then, so, but then she loved us as soon as we were born, myself and my brother. And so I think they, they bequeathed to me, um, like a kind of holistic understanding of what it meant to be a leader and to lead in really different ways. And some of that was through just by example. And some of that was through pushing the boundaries of what was accepted for women at the time. Um, And that's not as much what I got from the Indian side, right? Because I think the the British side was pushing the the boundaries and the edges. And the Indian side was more like, here are the traditions, here are the things we're passing down, don't lose them, preserve them, but not so much like push um, this new edge of culture and practice. Mm -hmm. So let's talk cultural appropriation because (laughs) this is something that comes up in different communities around lots of things but in particular I want to talk with you about yoga Mm -hmm. and so what is your take on it I don't want to I mean I I have lots of thoughts but I don't want to put any of them in there I'm just kind of curious what how you relate to that language of cultural appropriation particularly around yoga and Indian culture in the western spiritual adoption of that right the truth is it's still an exploration for me and it's an exploration because I do deeply believe in cultural um, connection and, and cross communication and I have visceral reactions to things. So I, I actually want to share those. Like if I go into a yoga studio and there's a Ganesh statue, a statue of the elephant God or a dancing Shiva um, or an Om symbol it confuses me and it sometimes makes me feel a little like taken aback as to why are these cultural symbols being used to like market uh, a practice that isn't actually connecting to that culture. So I have a lot of um, 
triggers, right, that come up that I process. And in the early days, and I wrote this article, so if you ever want to look it up, you could just look up my name and cultural appropriation or like decolonizing yoga, and it'll come up about being really like shocked and surprised and upset by that. And if, and we see it all the time. And so now I sometimes still have that reaction, but I more take it as an opportunity to get into conversation with those people. And the biggest one for me currently that's, that's causing the, like the sadness and the grief and the confusion is alcohol and yoga. And so when, you know, when it's like mantra and mimosas and so mantra is culturally a vibratory practice that is sacred sound, right? And the goal of that is to purify, to cleanse, to get higher and higher, right, vibration in the mind-body experience. And if we're pairing that with alcohol, it's, it's from a cultural perspective, it's disrespectful. I... I recollected like at first I was like what is she talking where is she going with this and then I've like totally seen the flyers for like vinyasa and vino yeah. um and I get the it's like so obvious to me the market that they're going towards which is like middle-aged moms and right. and housewives in like upper class communities is like likely often at least that's where I've like seen it and that that's like the thread of where that comes into my recollection um mm -hmm. interesting so can we talk a little bit about the difference because I feel like you might be able to educate me and our listeners in like yoga as a philosophy and like Hinduism as a culture and religion and that is related to land and yoga being birthed in different like how how do you differentiate, clarify, classify? Are they the same? Is there confusion? How can we understand? And I think that like, if I talk to a hundred different people who have different relationships to all of these things, different Hindus, different yoga practitioners, like I would find a hundred different answers mm -hmm. um, around like, and for me, I, what I'm experiencing is like a ownership. Uh, and I'm curious how you, and not to say that that's the, that's the blanket thing that all Hindus believe that they own yoga, but, um, I'm curious how you relate to that with your different cultures and your trainings and your experiences and, um, teachings that you've learned and cultivated. So to me, the, you know, the Buddha, how he taught us and said, don't believe what I tell you, go and discover it for yourself. That is also a very yogic tenet. And so the teachers I've connected to and resonated with, whether they're Hindu or Buddhist, or um, they don't call themselves anything, they're just yogis in caves that I've practiced with, are all saying yoga is about unity. Yoga is about self-growth. Um, Swaraj, self-rule is the word like what Gandhi used to get the British out of India, like self-empowerment. And it is not tied to any one religion. It never has been. It began before Hinduism. It was sort of almost like um, many of us and maybe many of your listeners are familiar with paganism, right? So a kind of pantheistic, earth-worshipping, sun-worshipping, um, non-formal religion. So yoga began when that was what was being practiced in the Indus Valley, in what's now Pakistan, in Northwest India, right, in that area. And so for me, it's completely not about ownership. It's not about saying yoga is Indian or yoga is Hindu or yoga is, you know, Jain or Buddhist or Sufi or any of the other religions that influenced yoga. It is about saying yoga is a practice that can lead us to freedom to liberation to um, freeing ourselves from the binds and the distractions that I think we all want to be free of and we need to honor those 
those people who were developing this methodology and they too evolved it, right? It's not like there's one person who was doing this. It was many people like, uh, my understanding is they're wandering essentially ascetics, right? Kind of on the fringes of society out in the forests um, around this really organized, sophisticated society back about 5,000 years ago um, near Mahanjadaro and in that area and they can get a plane. And these rebels really were like trying different methods to get to peace, to get to more joy, to get to freedom. Well, we're rebels too, right? Like that's why we're here doing what we're doing. And we have the same goals, more freedom, more self-empowerment, more liberation. And so I think we're in that lineage and we can honor that lineage just by naming it and, and recognizing those people and not by saying that anyone owns it. Right. And, you know, I brought up that specific culture because I think in the West, the adoption of the reception rather of yoga is confused with the adoption of Hindu yeah. culture. And like you said, like in the West, we often think of yoga as asana mm -hmm. and and asana has become like so you know you can find classes that are yoga on a bike and yoga on a surfboard and yoga on a like yoga with no spirituality that's just like fast-paced exercise movement like there's so many different things mm -hmm. and and not to judge any of them it's just to name that there has there has become a great variety and around the specific asanas and then this loss of this other other piece and so I love how you talk about um, originally yoga being about unity and I know that's a big thing that you carry in your work and how you support organizations in that are yoga based or are welcoming yoga to to understand what that means and how to integrate that into their corporate culture for lack of a better word and so um, my understanding around yoga means to yoke mm -hmm. to yoke together to like I used to be a seamstress and a yoke is a specific part of like a pant or a skirt um, where it's, it's like a it's like a wide waistband and it mm -hmm. basically like it can also be a piece that like bridges a bodice and a skirt and it bridges them together mm -hmm. um, and so it it is this sense of like bridging together yoking to bring together to have this unity and so I find nowadays with this conversation around cultural appropriation or about the west and the east and there's a lot of separation mm -hmm. in figuring out like whose is this and why and where is it being misused and where like how do we even know what the right way is because it's 5,000 years old and it's been so evolved through different people and cultures. And so as you are a bridge within yourself, my mm -hmm. understanding is that your work really supports the internal experience to then be um, the embodiment of that yoking out mm -hmm. in the world in action, not just for your own like aesthetic practice but mm -hmm. to share and so can you share a little bit about like what that yoga in action boots on the ground looks like when it's not just the self and the personal practice but it's affecting or it can affect if we're of service in this way like a whole community or people or culture or society what that can look like with the diversity and unity pieces that you're bringing in right so that's a big question <laughs> and I love it. I think that I always look to my teachers for stories and for examples. And so one of my, my main teachers of yoga is actually Mohandas K. Gandhi. And even though I never met him, I met some of his disciples, I guess you would say, or people who are carrying on his work in India. And I think it's so relevant for today you know, I heard a conversation with you and um, is it Elizabeth D'Alto? You were talking a lot about decolonization of our 
lives and of our practice, not going for the easiest possible choice because it causes so much harm. So in India, under um, British rule, the Indians had to buy cotton clothes. They didn't have to, but their cotton clothes were so much more comfortable than what they had, wool and really uncomfortable clothing. And it was like marked up 100%, you know, or 200%, and they couldn't afford it. And so Gandhi started this whole movement, you talking about being a seamstress reminded me of this, of Khadi, and Khadi is homespun cloth. And so they would get the raw material, and they would spin using um, like a, a homemade loom, they would spin their own cloth, and then make their own clothing. And so it was this like, internal empowerment, external economic empowerment, good for the environment, right? When we talk about in permaculture, stacking functions. So all aspects of this process were beneficial and it was restoring autonomy and integrity to the people who were doing it. And then what's great now is in India, they still sell khadi and everyone wears it, right? The British wear it, the, you know, any, anyone who's coming in. So it's, um, it's something that I think what the brilliance of that movement was, and, and so when I went to India, I learned how to spin with the charka and learned how to make my, my own clothing as well, is I got so much like pride and out of being able to do that work myself, out of being able to tangibly, like it took more time, but then I could touch that that article of clothing and know where it had come from and it really meant something it meant a lot more and so there's a a way of slowing down and pausing and asking ourselves where am i at right self-reflecting and in this next step i'm taking to bring this back to your question of our work in the world how can i be in alignment with the values that I actually have and then the actions that I'm taking out in the world. And for me, that's what yoga does, right? It, it, like if I get up and I'm grumpy and my value is to be kind, and I just wanted to share this um, quote from the Yajurveda. It says, um, make me so pure and strong that all beings may look upon me with friendship and may I also look upon all beings with friendship. So it's from 5,000 years ago. And I value that. I want to embody that. And, and so I wake up and I'm grumpy. I need to be aware of that, assess that, go and take even just a few breaths, you know, or maybe a quick asana practice and meditation before I then go and, and wake my son up for school. So it's really simple things, but being in alignment with the values that I have in my actions and then going out into the world to share. I like that because it offers a great sense of personal responsibility that we are so intimate with ourselves, so attuned to ourselves that we are aware of our grumpiness. Mm -hmm. And I think so many people exist in the world with the, the doing, the productivity. Um, mm -hmm. I talk a lot about on the show how much we value productivity mm -hmm. um, and how I think that's like a, a big detriment to our to our self intimacy to our intimacy with others and it's like false value uh, it's like where it's what we value is is not really actually that valuable um, when we look at the greater spectrum of life and so I love the way that you invited us to look at that because that sense of unity that I was talking about that you brought in is comes from unification with ourself unification with others a desire to connect with others and what I see so much in the world um, is this happening mm -hmm. please come here I want connection please come 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 but like I'm so afraid of that stay away mm -hmm. and it's confusing to all of us because we feel this deep desire. You know, we talk about our human needs as like food, water, shelter. And I think human connection is a deep um, need that we will literally like be in the dying state without human connection. Um, not that we'll die immediately. You know, you can go so long without food, so long without water and human connection. There's only so long we can go before we're really like, dying um and so 
I like this because it all starts with us, but then it, it aids in like, well, if I'm intimate with myself, if I know myself, then I can be aware of how I'm affecting my environment, how I'm affecting my relationships. And to me, that's like leadership, you know, that's the definition. And so I like that your work is really that people go to you to step into the embodied leadership of yoga in action, yoga off the mat in the world, being practiced through embodied living all the time and to have a practice where that's consistently cultivated, deepened, strengthened, um, mm -hmm. that is separate from that embodied action, but just the practice, the, the always cultivating. And I think that the two go together so beautifully. Um, and that yoga has been teaching us this and somehow we've, we've missed it. And we, we focus, we can focus on the, the lineage, the teacher, the tradition, and rather than like yoga as teacher, which I like that you have brought in, um, that yoga itself, the philosophy, the entity, the energy of yoga itself is the teacher, not, um, not just like, oh, well, my teacher that I studied with taught me this. It's like, there's so much more that comes from like the foundation of this practice that we can connect to and that I find that you have connected to and bring in so beautifully in, in your work. So go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say on that one thing I do is when I start my practice, either on the matter or not, I ask what would yoga want of me today? How can I be yoga today? How can I be yoga here? And I invite all my students to ask that as they're really learning the tools. There's some really specific tools, which some of which I could share here. There's a lot of them that, um, that they learn that come from this tradition that then we, we take out and we make it relevant and we apply and we practice day in and day out. And then change happens, change happens internally. And then all of a sudden it's almost inevitable that when we're practicing them, that then we want to go and serve others and help others. We can step into, into leadership with a, so much integrity because it's natural. Yeah, I really agree with that. And, um, like you've said, yoga leads us to union and connection with others and the broken parts of ourselves and the broken parts of others and the things in society that we judge as other or different and shun. And, you know, I think when a lot of people would hear the statement like, oh, yoga can bring us all together, like bridge these cultures, like heal wars, like stop all this mm. um, othering and separation is really like people picturing like parks of diverse groups like oming together and that's just going to solve everything. And I think that's a misinterpretation of what you're really offering because it comes from the deeper embodiment of the value system. And so whether anyone who's listening relates to like yoga as a philosophy or practice, a teacher, I think the foundation of having knowing your values and having them really set for yourself as an anchor that you can come, that we can all come back to our value system is in and of itself practicing yoga. And, and I think for most of us, we have shared values. We have um, the desire to have kindness and connection and um, authenticity, that these are values. If we really sit down and stop our jobs and our um, pause from them, not like cease them completely, but just take a moment to get out of that productivity that we'd find a shared value system across nations and colors and faiths um, again and again and again, because we're human and we desire the same things. Can I yeah, yeah, please. There's something about that? Because I've followed your work and love your work uh, for a long time now and one of the things I most appreciate is you don't shy away from dealing with the difficult parts of ourselves right like the shadow or grief or sadness and I also think in the yoga world we do a lot of bypassing that um, what's called spiritual bypass or moving through something very intellectually or getting to oh we're all one light and love you know blessings blessings all of that and yeah, right on. That is the goal. And I share that value. 
And for me, and I'm embodying this, I feel like I'm in the process of embodying this more and more. We have to look at the shadow, or I have to, in order to then be able to move to that true unity, you know, not like fake unity. And so when people often, you know, in the work that I do, they say, oh, but I don't see race. Like, I don't see you as different. Um, So what's the problem here? Then I have to take a deep breath and, and explain, well, actually, I want you to see the difference, but just not judge it. Or if you judge it, be willing to then come and talk to me and for me to share my perspective. And so that delving into the shadow, our own, but also, honestly, a lot of the work that I'm really passionate about is redefining trauma or expanding our understanding of trauma because there's work in trauma-informed yoga, from just shock trauma and developmental trauma to also systemic trauma. So trauma around sexism, racism, you know, ableism, um, all of the different isms that we, that divide us and separate us, understanding that as a major cause of division, and then using the tools to look at it, examine it out around us, but also within ourselves, and then move towards using the tools of yoga, which are very concrete for healing those, um, those traumas. I really appreciate you bringing that up. I think that that's, um, it's something that we really need to have more discussions about and how, you know, when you said yoga does this, I know that you're talking about the Western adoption of like spirituality, which is influenced by yoga amongst other things that has become its own kind of new age chef sect of spirituality if you want to if you want to call it that um and I feel like that's really valuable because I think it's so it's something that's so attractive for the for lack of a better word like muggles um it's so attractive like when someone's having like a spiritual like oh I'm kind of bored with my life I'm not feeling fulfilled and then there's this thing that makes me feel alive and loving and like it's so much love and it's so much light and it feels so good it's attractive for the world that we live in that is in that kind of um push every day and so it can become the place where people go to and then some get stuck there and some are disillusioned and some come out of that and are like wow I have this whole other um spectrum of my person that is traumatized and angry and has experienced so many things and I haven't really dove into that and I find that that invitation is like the best thing ever Um, and I love the way that you have shaped you know how how yoga can aid in diversity but how yoga in and of itself is diverse Mm -hmm. it is not just like it's so um broad and I think that the word yoga has be in and of itself just as a title has become so misconstrued Mm -hmm. that we forget about all these amazing pieces of this philosophy of being that Mm -hmm. it that any that relates to all life and all humans Mm -hmm. um and I just really like the way that you invited us back into that remembrance of yoga giving us so many tools to just be Mm. in this human experience which has the like parts too and the the fact that you address societal trauma because Mm. I think that's something that we don't think about as a collective experience and so just in your work of like diversity and unity using yoga as a teacher to aid in the influence of these things in our culture which are so needed how that also impacts um it's not just the personal practitioner, but it affects the whole society. It, fe- it affects the system if we allow it to. Mm-hmm. It really does. And we've seen a lot of research and studies now in schools where they're doing restorative justice programs where students, instead of detention, they go do yoga, they go meditate. And it's as long oh, as there's agency. That's like my, I'm so happy to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, but you know what? It's not so okay. Two things on that: it's it's happening, but it's isolated. It doesn't yet have institutional 
far-reaching support. It's happening in private schools. It's often called mindfulness or mindful movement. It's not called yoga. I'm fine with that. It doesn't matter to me what we call it. What matters to me is that it's getting, you know, the tools of self-regulation and, um, and healing are getting to these young people. And we have a ways to go. And that's part of what I'm hoping to contribute to with everything that I'm doing. Beautiful. Uh, and I know you're doing a lot. I know you're working with some amazing organizations to bring this insight in, in their um, yoga alliance and other, other communities that, that are really wanting to see this as like, how can this thing that's touched our lives so much really aid in this collective need for healing and coming together? Um, and yeah, I think that the word yoga, like I was saying before, has a lot of charge. Mm -hmm. um, and so calling it mindfulness, calling it whatever, like it's just a way of being. Mm -hmm. And and it includes a lot of awareness and kindness and personal responsibility. And like, great, like whatever you want to call it, if you love this word, um, developing that within our culture and our communities, I think it's, I think it's going to be valuable. So I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, the kids love it and they get it, you know, it's like they get ahimsa means not harming or being kind and um, they're so cute when I read them stories because I also teach preschool yoga. I really believe in, in working with all different ages and all different demographics. It's important to me for me as a learner to always be both in learning from other people and training myself always and then also be working with different populations and so I learned so much from the kids because they they forced me to boil it down like what is the essence of the eightfold path right or of these ethical principles well be kind tell the truth right don't lie um, don't take stuff that belongs to others share be generous and you know um, try to help yourself and others be happy it's really simple. And then they take on the practices of grounding, of orienting, like looking around, noticing where they are, paying attention to themselves in a space, centering, connecting to their own power, and even their breath as well. And then relating. And because we always end every class with um, rubbing our hands together when I teach the kids and whispering something to ourselves and giving ourselves, you know, may I be happy or may I be loved or may I have fun today. And then we'll do, we'll rub our hands and we'll send that out to their families or their friends. And they really feel it and they really believe in it. And I see them using the tools, like using their fingers to breathe. Um, when they're frustrated or upset later in the week. So it's it's such a powerful practice for all of us because us as adults get dysregulated too and then it can bring us back into self-regulation. Yeah, I think the kids are so much more um, spongy in welcoming new tools, whereas like adults will learn something and then not practice it. Um, <laughs> that's what I've seen in like my my partner does mindfulness education and training and like the little kids versus like the staff at the school, it's like how they grasp onto it and, and adopt it into their lives and how it, they allow it to impact them is so, so different uh, just because of that age development. Yeah. And I'm right. fascinated with systems change, right? So right. like the, he's doing with both the kids and the staff, ultimately there's going to be a critical consciousness change and then everyone is is going to be there in that environment in that school it's going to become the norm and i think we're at the forefront of that and there i have a lot of hope and a lot of joy and positivity in this work as well as sometimes a lot of grief but the hope comes from institutions like yoga alliance that uh, i get to work with that are changing the standards or different service organizations that are taking these tools and practices into communities that um, that really desperately need them. So we're there. We're we're at the forefront of that curve, and I think we're kind of riding riding the wave. So my hope is that for anyone listening, that you just 
keep practicing and find find the teachers that connect you know um, there's so many great teachers out there and so um, continue to learn I think that's the best thing that we can we can all do is just really be students of yoga students of practices students of mindfulness yeah thank you so much for all that you shared it's so beautiful and so there's so many invitations in the last 40 minutes of our time, the, the invitations for everyone who is listening. I know that each one will pick up something that they can deepen into and explore within themselves. And I find that I've gotten a bunch of those. And I, every time I speak with you, those invitations for me to go deeper come up. It's just the yoga playing through you as the teacher, you being the vessel for it to, to teach all of us in its own way. So thank you for, for allowing that to come through so beautifully. Thank you. Yeah. So one of our last questions is three women in your life who have given you the permission slip to be more you, have inspired you in some way, who have, you know, dead alive famous, we don't know them. They're all welcome. Who are they and why? Mm. That's such a great question. Permission slip to be more me. Aisha Mason. And she's a nonviolent activist in Los Angeles right now doing a lot of work with the Poor People's Campaign. She taught me that about how to have grace in the marriage of spirituality and social justice um, just through her embodiment. One of my best friends, Ariane White, who um, does restorative justice work with youth in Los Angeles also. And... Vandana Shiva in India, because her work is so simple, like it gets to the root to collecting seeds and saving seeds. Uh, and so using that, like, example of doing something so close to the earth, so small, but can create this ripple of humongous change by helping farmers all across the country. Beautiful. I love that. This is one of my favorite parts of the interviews to see how we're all woven mm -hmm. together. So, um, any, can you share with our audience about where they can find you, anything that you have upcoming, links to your work, all of that good stuff? Yes. Okay, great. So if you're interested in my work with yoga or wanting to train with me, then you would um, check out Ignite Be Well, which is a yoga teacher training school in Orlando, Florida, and also does online trainings. And then if you're interested in connecting around yoga and service, yoga and social justice, really being a vessel for yoga as we're creating change, then Susanna Barkataki. And there, um, I also do a lot of speaking and consulting and teaching all, all across the country. So um, those would be the two best places. And then there's some good stuff in the works, but um, I'll have to check back in with you as, as it unfolds. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for being here today. It was truly a pleasure to have you join us. And thank you for the work that you do in the world. It's so inspiring and I can feel the ripple effects and the impact um, yeah. that you're making. Thank you so much, Luna. I'm so grateful for this opportunity and this conversation. It feels uh, so embodied and so heartful for me to, and you are another one of those women who I value so much <laughs> as someone who really sees me, but also like all of the women, our peers, right, in our, in our gifts. And so we need each other. We're, we're doing this together. So thank you. Absolutely. Well, thank you for being here. And thank you to our beautiful audience. We love you. We couldn't do this without you. And we'll see you next Monday. Bye, everyone. Bye. It's freebie time. We love you so much. And we couldn't do this without you. And we know that you're passionate about everything that we're discussing here. So we've created not one, but two free giveaways for you. One is the amazing in-depth interactive ebook exploring the seven pillars of feminine leadership. And the second is a guided meditation for you to align to your heart's knowing. Head on over to ladieswholeadpodcast.com to sign up and instantly get both of those amazing goodies. Thank you all so much for being here. 
What a gift to share in such beautiful communion with these wise ladies who lead. As you know, the likes, the stars, clicks, comments, reviews, and shares are so gratefully welcomed as it helps spread the word and inspire others to lead from within. Thank you. To hear more of our other guest interviews and to learn more about this movement, head on over to ladieswholeadpodcast.com where you can subscribe to never miss an episode. I'm so grateful we spent this time together. Until our next time, let your heart lead you where you